After more than three decades of successful nuclear disarmament, the U.S. and soon afterwards Russia withdrew from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which was signed by U.S. President Ronald Reagan and Soviet Union leader Mikhail Gorbachev in 1987. While the collapse of the nuclear treaty sparked concerns of a new arms race, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres warned that the world will lose an invaluable break on nuclear war. What does the demise of the nuclear treaty mean for global security? How can the US and Russia reconfigure their military power? And how should China react to possible US missile deployment in East Asia? To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined in the Beijing studio by Tui Hongjian, Director of the Department for European Studies at the China Institute of International Studies. And we will also speak via satellite to Russian defense analyst Pavel Fagenhoff in Moscow and via Skype to Peter Kuznick in Nagasaki, Japan, who is a professor of history and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute of American University. That's our topic. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. First of all, do you think the demise of the uh, IF Treaty mean the end of the, um, what you call, detente or the end of the Cold Peace? Sorry, let me put it this way. Do you think the demise of the treaty actually will spell disaster? Does it mean the resumption of a Cold War? I think it could be maybe the first break to um, undermine the whole, I mean, fundamental uh, basis to end of the Cold War and to protect, uh, to some degree, uh, the peace after the Cold War. As we know, uh, you know, it's a very, very uh, landmark, I mean, achievement for both the uh, Soviet Union and the uh, United States to uh, make it um, uh, very, very, I mean, uh, substantial uh, result that now it's end for, of Cold War and we need to have a you know, mechanism to limit the uh, nuclear weapon for both two sides. And also, to a large degree, it's also a, a promise uh, from the uh, United States and the uh, former Soviet Union to Europe and uh, to the other part of the world that there will be a break, just like the uh, uh, General Secretary of the UN mentioned, for any possible or uh, potential uh, nuclear war. Indeed, once it happens, because there will be some uh, panic among all of these, uh, uh, you know, security players, that it will be it just uh, maybe the first step, and then there will be some other, I mean, very very important, uh, uh, fundamental uh, basis for the whole, I mean, disarmament and uh, uh, nuclear, I mean, uh, arms control uh, system. So I think so far there will be some more panic, there will be some more uh, uh, fears, there are some more, uh, I mean, uncertainties in future. Let me go to Pavel Fagerhoff. With the end of the Cold War over three decades ago, Pavel, China feels that it falls victim to the growing rivalry and mistrust between Washington and Moscow regarding particularly nuclear disarmament. Now, do you believe the demise of the treaty will inevitably spell disasters and will resume a new Cold War? Uh, well, uh, the treaty has ended on August the 2nd. Well, nothing terrible happened immediately after that, uh, but there is a very nasty future potential of growing conflict and growing uh, rivalry and actually uh, much more risk because, uh, of course, uh, intercontinental nuclear and uh, weapons uh, continued, though and, uh, they were kind of regulated and the level was much lower than during the Cold War, but they are there. Uh, but intercontinental weapons are intercontinental. They take time uh, to reach targets, some 40 minutes after launch or something like that. Intermediate uh, missiles fly much shorter distances and the time from launch to hit may be minutes, may be less than 10 minutes, less than 5 minutes, which means that there's very little time to consider something, to consider a response, and so the knee-jerk response may be an all-out 
uh, reply with all, everything you have if you see something flying. So the risk of uh, going into a war, into a regional or even global war, and maybe using nuclear weapons very early, is going to be much higher without the treaty than it was with the treaty. Despite the impact of uh, mutual, uh, mutually assured destruction or mad policy uh, that was initiated at the height of the Cold War, um, most in Europe feel that the symbolic implications of this landmark treaty, the IFN, the INF Treaty, has actually helped Europe avert a third world war. Now let me go to Peter Kuznick, an expert of nuclear studies. What do you think of the impact of ending uh, this intermediate range nuclear force treaty that has helped conclude the Cold War? Well, we have to remember that uh, this is not the first step. Uh, really, the nuclear disarmament, nuclear arms control architecture began dismantling when the United States abrogated the ABM Treaty 17 years ago. Uh, then uh, now we've got gotten rid of the INF Treaty. Uh, we also, uh, the United States tore up the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. There are people in Washington who have the ear of the president, especially Bolton and Pompeo and Morrison, who are intent upon tearing up the entire architecture of arms control. The next thing in their target, the next target is the uh, New START Treaty. So we're, the danger is we're on the verge of nuclear arc anarchy. We're on, the we're on the verge of returning to the Cold War arms race, to the 1980s when we had nearly 70,000 nuclear weapons. We've got about 14,000 nuclear weapons now. That's enough to kill effectively all life on the planet. But this is, might be the best we're going to be because uh, it could potentially get much worse from here if the people in charge, especially in Washington, are allowed to destroy the entire architecture of arms control. Peter, do you think uh, whatever President Trump does, uh, particularly in foreign policy, should be viewed as anything but Obama? And President Obama, when the New, uh, I, I mean, when the uh, prize, uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize, he became the laureate of the Nobel Peace Prize for calling for nuclear disarmament, and President Trump was pouring scorns on this idea of having a nuclear free world, hence he announced the end of intermediate range nuclear force treaty. Is that the idea that has governed obsessively President Donald Trump since he took office? Well, it's actually a little more complicated, I would suggest. Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize for his Prague speech calling for the abolition of nuclear weapons, but he even says in that, pro in that speech that the United States won't be the first country to give up its nuclear weapons. The United States will be the last country to give up its nuclear weapons. And if you look at the reality of Obama's policy, Obama called for a, million, a trillion dollar, 30 year nuclear modernization program is actually $1.7 trillion. And what is this about? It's about making America's nuclear weapons more usable and more deadly and more efficient. Uh, so Obama should give back that Nobel Peace Prize because he certainly didn't deserve it. The danger is that all nine nuclear powers are modernizing. If we look at uh, Vladimir Putin's March 1, 2018 State of the Nation address, he announced that Russia has developed five new nuclear weapons, all of which can circumvent America's missile defense systems. So we are already in the early stages of a new arms race, and there are people in Washington who welcome that new arms race. As Trump says, we're going to bury them in a new, uh, new arms race. Uh, and his backers in the military-industrial complex, who are getting wealthier and wealthier off of this, are applauding this. So we're on the verge of a very, very dangerous situation. 
in terms of the potential for nuclear war. We're in the more, most dangerous, precarious situation we've been in at least since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so uh, the world should not deny, not hide its eyes to the new reality, which becomes more and more dangerous by the day. Thank you so much. Hong Jian, what do you think of the alarm by Peter Kuznick that uh, we're going to have a devastating nuclear war? Uh, should we fail to take enough actions to prevent this uh, means of nuclear deterrence from being concluded? If we look at the uh, consequences of the uh, death of the uh, INF Treaty, we can find, firstly, there will be no limitation, especially for the major uh, nuclear powers, including the United States and, the Soviet, and uh, Russia, uh, which means that uh, for both two countries, now they could have a, you know, a large space to develop the uh, uh, intermediate range missiles, missiles with a uh, you know, nuclear uh, head. The secondly, there will be no regulation even for other countries, for other players. So there will be some more uh, risks. I agree with our uh, American guest that uh, there will be some maybe more uh, encouragement, more, um, uh, you know, more, more movement for any players to develop its own uh, uh, nuclear uh, weapon and its uh, 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 missiles like that. So that's also the reason why now most of the European countries they are worried about the uh, consequences of this, uh, uh, you know, the death of the INF, because which will give more space for uh, Russia, for the United States, or even other uh, countries that develop their own, I mean, nuclear weapon and, and so on. And uh, of course, I think now the question is how could the international community do something, because. Uh, for this uh, INF treaty, we can find out, you know, context to do something. But now, if it's possible for the international community to provide some more solution, for example, besides this uh, that INF treaty, and could could we find out a, a new solution? Just like uh, some uh, European countries proposed already, that perhaps there will be some uh, new context for. Uh, uh, you know, the disarmament and the arms control system, not only for nuclear weapon and also for some uh, uh, new, maybe more advanced uh, uh, weapons, including the, uh, uh, you know, rockets, including the, uh, how to say, the, uh, the, the AI uh, weapons and so on. So I think now, yes, it's time for, uh, for the international community to rethink that uh, how could we find out uh, a new way, a new solution to protect the peace, not only uh, from the threat of the uh, military risk, and also from the potential, I mean, threats from uh, maybe uh, more advanced technology. At this moment, we have no idea about the alternative solution uh, following the demise of the treaty. However, uh, uh, Secretary General of NATO, Mr. Stoltenberg, said European leaders would not agree to accept any deployment of nuclear missiles in mm. response to uh, the end of this uh, INF treaty. Uh, what would happen to Europeans who should be the first uh, who are seriously concerned about the stability and security of a continent Europe without the security umbrella of the US government? Mm. So far, uh, we can find out that there, there will be some uh, very complicated uh, concerns from the European side uh, towards this um, INF treaty issue. Firstly, uh, indeed, they're worried about the uh, possible uh, military risk, especially nuclear weapon risk uh, between Russia and the United States. Even as we know before the uh, uh, United States withdrew uh, from the uh, INF Treaty, uh, already, I mean, from the Russian side, uh, they announced some uh, new program to develop some uh, new uh, 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 missile system like that. And uh, especially now for some uh, uh, Central and Eastern European countries, because they are facing, uh, namely, some uh, threatened security threat from uh, Russia, so they do have some requirement uh, to invite the United States to deploy some uh, uh, missile system in their own countries. So there will be very, very big potential for the, uh, uh, the military risk. Another, I think, a big concern from the European side is they are worrying about a kind of a strategic decoupling with the United States. Because if we look at the INF Treaty itself, not only it's a 
limitation, it's a regulation between uh, Russia and the United States. And it's also a kind of a, you know, a, a guarantee provided from the United States uh, to uh, European countries. So once there is not INF treaty, for most of the European countries, they felt that they could not get you know, uh, enough security guarantee from the United States. So they have, they have been lived, maybe, in the shadow of the uh, uh, security, cons uh, security threat from uh, uh, Russia or from other. So I think that's a very, very uh, big issue now for European countries. And they try to do something. They try to do something. But another question is, uh, for most of, of European countries, they've got a less and less influence on Washington. Let me go back to uh, Pavel. What do you think of the prospects of having growing independence from major European countries following Brexit? Uh, for example, French politicians said recently that they're going to pursue a more independent defense policy after President Trump called for uh, more shares by European economies for the NATO spending. Uh, what, what do you think of the aftermath um, and do you think uh, European countries such as Germany and uh, France will forge their own German Franco axis and keep a distance from the United States. Pavel, uh, let me repeat my question. Uh, do you think European politicians are likely to pursue a more independent uh, defense policy? Let me go to uh, Peter Kuznick. What do you think of concerns of European politicians in pursuing their own more independent uh, defense policy following President Trump's advocacy for uh, European leaders to share more of the NATO spending? Uh, do you think uh, uh, leaders such as Angela Merkel and Macron will carefully keep a distance uh, from the appeal of the White House? Well, I think the Europeans are very concerned about U.S. policy right now. Europeans were very supportive of the Iran nuclear deal. Europeans were very upset when Trump pulled out and destroyed the Iran nuclear deal. They knew that there was no logical, rational reason to do so, that the deal was working as well as could be hoped, and uh, perhaps better than anybody hoped. The IAEA certified that Iran was complying with its end of the deal, and yet Trump went and unilaterally blew the whole deal up. The Europeans have been trying to find some way to circumvent that, try to set up different financing mechanisms so they can continue to trade. But they're very concerned about Trump's uh, trade war policies, his sanctions policies, his using the dollar in order to control, to keep Peter people under uh, U.S. control right now, uh, at the same time that he's provocatively moving to create a more dangerous world. So I think the Europeans are distancing themselves from the United States. There seem to be new alliances forming. You've got, on the one hand, this closer relationship between Russia and China. You've got uh, India playing an interesting and complicated role, Turkey also. Uh, and the Europeans looking for a measure of independence. Uh, they do not like what's happening. They do not like the growing militarization. They do not want these American weapons. But the other thing we have to realize is that in some ways, the INF Treaty from a military standpoint was pretty much outdated. It did not include China, which has many weapons in that range. It uh, also only dealt with the land-based uh, missiles in a certain range. There were also sea launch missiles. There were air launch missiles that could already hit Europe or Russia in a short period of time without much warning or time to respond. So what we need is real leadership. We need Xi Jinping. We need Vladimir Putin. We need uh, Modi. We need other leaders to take leadership to say that the world situation has become too dangerous. When the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists announced in January 2018 that they had moved the hands of the doomsday clock to two minutes before midnight, that was the closest they'd moved it since the early 1950s after the hydrogen bomb tests. 
Last week, the Russian deputy foreign minister said he thought that we're really one minute from midnight. Our species deserves something better. We deserve better leaders who are going to take real leadership. We don't want a new arms race. We don't want new nuclear anarchy. And we certainly don't want anything that could possibly precipitate a nuclear war. I'm here in Nagasaki. It's obviously an about ago, Peter, days ago. for the Chinese politicians to avoid having nuclear arms race in Northeast Asia. For example, China had played a very important role in the six-party talks uh, to ensure nuclear disarmament in the divided Korean Peninsula. And there's no question about Hong Jian, uh, China's vision for having a peaceful co-prosperity, for example, uh, the message that BRI delivers to the rest mm. of the world. But what do you think of the immediate response from the Chinese foreign ministry towards uh, um, the uh, end and demise of the INF yeah. Treaty? Mm -hmm. I th firstly, uh, certainly, just like uh, uh, we mentioned, that China always uh, joined into the, uh, you know, the common uh, efforts from uh, most of the countries in international community. We try to uh, find out the way uh, to strengthen, I mean, the basis of the uh, arms control and the disarmament uh, architecture or system. But at the same time, I think that uh, China also need to find out its uh, position to do something, because as we understand, uh, because of the uh, INF treaty issue, now uh, in some countries there are also, especially from the United States, because according to the media, uh, the, uh, Mr. Trump's uh, uh, intention of uh, withdrawal from the INF treaty, one of them, uh, the, one of the reasons is uh, he wants to uh, uh, keep China into a so-called uh, new INF treaty like that. But uh, according to our understanding, that uh, not only because of the size of the uh, nuclear uh, arsenals and also uh, the willing and also the policy of uh, Chinese uh, nuclear, we, we, we could not find any possibility that China will be part of the, uh, any, I mean, alternative of IF treaty in future. But indeed, I think China uh, should do something, I think especially, for example, how could China and most European countries we can find out more space to find out more common stance to deal with any uh, possible uh, risks from the death of the INF Treaty. And then could China and some other uh, European countries and maybe more uh, uh, players in the uh, uh, international arena to find out uh, maybe a higher uh, uh, standard, uh, standard, I mean, a context to deal with this issue. But of course, I think now uh, maybe for China, the first issue is how could China do something to stop any tendons uh, by uh, especially the winning from the United States uh, administration to expand the so-called uh, military risk or nuclear weapons risk from European to Asia. Okay, China's nuclear capability, uh, which is quite limited in scale, aside. Let's look at what John Bolton said recently about the deployment of a conventional missiles in East Asia. Mm. Now China says we have a zero tolerance for that. What does that mean? I said we, that means that firstly China will uh, do a lot, especially in dipl diplomatic way, to stop any kind of this, um, uh, I mean, the, the trend also any willing from the United States to expand, just like I mentioned, the so-called uh, military race or nuclear weapons race into Asia. But secondly, I think it just like I mentioned, that China should do something more actively. For example, China should provide a more constructive solution to deal with this uh, situation after the uh, IF Treaty. And even if we uh, uh, find out that uh, it's just a first uh, step by American administration to undermine the whole uh, arms control and the disarmament uh, architecture, China also should, uh, you know, join into the, uh, you know, common. Uh, efforts with other uh, security players to do something more. So I think, firstly, China will do something to protect its own interests. And at the same time, I think that China should find out more uh, common sense with other players and partners. At the same time, Pavel, <coughs> excuse me, Pavel, at the same time, China is clearly aware that ROK, Japan, and uh, Manila have all made it very clear that they are not ready to accept uh, uh, the American proposal at this moment to, to deploy uh, intermediate range nuclear forces in their own territories. What do you think of uh, their 
interesting position on this issue? Well, of course, um, Australia is basically too far away anyway, and it's uh, military technically rather senseless to base any kind of intermediate uh, range missiles in Australia. But the United States are developing a new type of intermediate land-based ballistic missile. It actually won't be nuclear tipped. It will be uh, uh, conventional, but it's going to have a very, very high uh, accuracy, maybe a hundred times more than present uh, missiles of the, pre the previous generation with the CEP, um, circular error probability, uh, measured not in hundreds of meters, but maybe in hundreds of centimeters. And there are possibilities to deploy in Asia also not only sea-based, but land-based. Uh, say, it, uh, theoretically, uh, militarily, it would be very advantageous state to secretly deploy in Mongolia to target at the same time Chinese and Russian uh, very important uh, high value targets. Or maybe in Vietnam, or maybe actually in India, which has its own intermediate missiles, but they are 100 times less accurate than the new American generation. Or maybe in Poland, uh, without uh, actually involving NATO on a bilateral basis. The problem with these uh, new American missiles is that they can be, de they're air deployable. They can be deployed very quickly in a time of crisis and rather covertly. And that means that they're going to be a highly destabilizing factor because no one's going to know for sure where they are and where, from where they can be launched. And having them, and they'll be much cheaper, they'll actually also be very cheap compared to sea-based on submarines or uh, frigates or destroyers. So this is going to, maybe, though they're not nuclear, could be a highly destabilizing strategic factor in the future. Well, hours before the U.S. pulled back from the arms um, control treaty, United States President Donald Trump imposed new sanctions, Pavel, he imposed new sanctions on Russia over the poisoning of a former spy in Britain. Analysts say that Trump's latest sanctions against Russia gave him more ammunition to, de to declare himself a tough on Russia ahead of the elections so one year from now. Uh, what do you think of uh, the prospects of having a severely strained bilateral tie between Putin and Trump? Is that the political theater or do you think this is the real stuff? Well, personal ties apparently are not that strained, and the new portion of American sanctions is more, well, symbolic. Though it will have, of course, a negative effect on the overall atmosphere, including business investment atmosphere. But the problem is that in Washington, in Congress, and in other parts of government, there's a, a, a strong kind of uh, bipartisan position that Russia should be punished more. And Trump is under tremendous pressure from Congress and actually from people in his own administration to get uh, off the wall and do something more to punish Russia. So there's a possibility that after symbolic sanctions there could be uh, something more important because for Trump, of course, re-election is the prime target and uh, strategic matters in relations with Ch China or Russia are secondary to the need to get re-elected. And that is also, of course, a very destabilizing factor because America goes into the election uh, cycle and that means foreign relationships are going to be delegated to pe Thank you other so much, different Pavel. people, not very high positions. Thank you so much, Pavel, for being with us uh, and all your insightful comments on the issue of uh, nuclear disarmament. Uh, I'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye.